Good morning and welcome to the FSR Advanced Webinar entitled Smart Words. This presentation is prepared by Pablo Frias and Ignacio Perez Ariaga. However, at this time, in Professor Perez Ariaga won't be able to participate in this webinar due to some current commitments, uh, some very urgent commitments overseas. Therefore, this webinar will be presented only by Pablo Frias, who is assistant, assistant professor and head of Smart and Green Networks Research Group at the Institute for Research in Technology at Camillas University in Madrid. My name is Magdalena Namosh and I'm a training coordinator at Florence School of Regulation and I will be also moderating today's webinar. Therefore, before we will connect with our today's speaker, I would like to point out a couple of issues regarding the webinar agenda. So the first point is the introduction. So uh, this is exactly what I'm doing right now. In this point, I will also briefly explain the control panel that you can see right now in the upper right corner of your computer screen. Then we will be able to proceed with the presentation on smart grids. Then there will be a time for a Q&A. In this section, our today's speaker will reply for the questions submitted by the audience. And I will explain briefly how you can submit the questions to Pablo Frias in just a couple of seconds. And then I will conclude this webinar with some final announcements. Okay, so this is the control panel that you can see right now. And I would like to explain just briefly a couple of features on this control panel. So the first one is this uh, little orange arrow. This is a button where uh, if you click on that, the control panel will be minimized and you will be able to follow this webinar on your full computer screen. However, if you would like to reopen it in order to use uh, other options, therefore you just have to click in the same place. However, if you would like to check something on the internet or maybe check something on your computer, but you would still like to remain connected to the webinar, just please click on the button below. This is to minimize the window. It means that the webinar, the webinar icon will remain on your taskbar so you can come back to it whenever you wish. And below there is the hand raise tool. And this is the tool that I would like you to, to use right now. Therefore, if you can see the presentation and if you can hear me just please click here and i will note that from the technical point of view everything is okay and that we can proceed to the further sections of this webinar so i am checking right now whether you're voting and i can see that most of you have clicked so very good thank you very much for that and uh however if you have any technical problems or if you will have any technical problems during the webinar please use the question box. And this is also a place where you can submit your questions to Pablo Frias and he will try to answer for as many questions as possible during the Q&A at the end of this webinar. Uh, I just strongly encourage you to submit very brief questions because in this way we'll have more time to answer for as many questions as possible. Okay, so now it's time to connect with our today's speaker. So I will unmute Pablo and just check whether everything is fine. Good morning, Pablo. Can you hear me? Perfectly, Magda. I can hear you also perfectly. Therefore, I can connect to your computer screen, and this is exactly what I'm doing right now. Okay. We should be able to see your presentation. Yes, I am able to see your presentation. I think that also our audience. Therefore, I leave you the floor. I will connect back to you again in around 40 minutes. Uh, therefore, good luck. Okay. Thank you very much. Magda for your kind presentation and good morning all. So let me first introduce why this seminar. So we see here now news from President Obama indicating in 2009 giving like $3.4 billion to smart grid. We also have some picture of Angela Merkel uh, together with Dilma promoting the smart grids in an in international congress. So this seems that the smart grid is nowadays and in the last decade a uh, really trending topic but we have to be very careful and we have to take into account always this Schneider, the classic change curve. So nowadays we are uh, where the man with the hand is, so we have with a situation with great expectations, we have a huge amount of money to invest. However, the next stop may be some kind of uh, despair, distrust or disappointment because at the beginning maybe uh, the, for instance, the, the final electricity bill for the domestic consumers, instead of going down, will raise up just a little bit. So we, as engineers and regulators, we have to be very careful and we have to be very intelligent in order to drive this smart grid system into finding the light at the end of the tunnel. The tunnel, 
get into rational expectations and maybe pricing becomes more comprehensive. Okay, so let's go to the objectives of today's talk and here are the questions that we want to answer today is that what is smart grid? Why are smart grids needed? How much do they cost? How much, how to achieve this uh, smart grid? Okay, so let me first, in order to introduce the drivers for smart grids, let me first uh, go for the first poll for today in order to get your feedback of what do you understand by, uh, by smart grids. So let me check. So I will launch the poll now. So you can answer and you have different options. Uh, the first one would be the energy networks designed to achieve a sustainable energy system. Second one, smart meter infrastructure is uh, the key driver for smart grid. And uh, the third and final one uh, has to do with the uh, current update of the electricity network in order to meet the objectives of uh, the European Commission, the 2020 objective for 220. Okay. So I see that now half of you have already answered. We wait up for a couple of seconds. Okay. Just uh, okay. So let me close now the poll to see your results. Okay, and I will share with you these results. Okay, so. I mean, I think this, uh, uh, the first answer is, I mean, the three answers are more or less correct. So the important thing is which are maybe be behind your background is the answer. So let's go now into the detail of, uh, of the poll. So let's go now to which are the drivers that we face in this market. So First, we have to take into account that it's in the European Union there are three main drivers for the energy system policy. So we have on the one hand environment, we have security supply, and we have internal market. So we will see now how the penetration of renewables, for instance, will pose a, a real challenge for the creation of power systems. So smart grids will be somehow the key in order to get to this point. Okay, so what is smart grid? So Initially, there is no single definition. I mean, we can find out many ones. One I really make me interesting is this one uh, from the Smart Grid platform. It is very, there are two keywords which are uh, bolded. It's uh, the intelligent networks that are able to integrate the new distributed energy resources. So it, it, it's about intelligence, okay, in the network, and it also has to do with the integration of more renewables. So on the one hand, this has to do with technologies, with a better planning of and a better control of the power systems. And most important, in order to enable these energy services to become true. So that's why there is another approach in order to see the definition of the smart grid is about building, expanding, and operating the system in order to achieve the objectives of the 2020 trend. But it is also very important to know what is not a smart grid. So a smart grid is not about gas. A smart grid covers both transmission and distribution levels. Smart grids are not new grids, but they re still rely on copper and iron. And there's no revolution, but the current evolution of the current system that we are using nowadays. And it is very important that the smart grid does not mean that 100% of the technology for a smart will be deployed in our network. So smart grid, it is very important, it's not just metering, but metering is the key issue in order to achieve a smart system uh, in the power itself. Okay, so here you can see which is more or less the different scopes of the smart metering is more or less focused on the domestic field. If we go up in an upper level, we find the smart grids where you have both the distribution network on the one side and the transmission network on the other, so these are the different electric elements. So, so this is the, the current infrastructure we are working with. We have the transmission system on the one hand with the connection of conventional generation, wind generation, and solar, which is the new renewables. And on the other hand, we have the distribution service station where we connect all those small power 
distributed generation together with the uh, with domestic industrial and loads. So what we expect in the future is that they will change and how okay so new agents will appear new agents such as electric vehicles such as storage such as aggregation for for uh, with the name of virtual power plant etc so this is very important because at the end we are going to change not only the way the infrastructure is uh, planned but also how it is operated for instance we will integrate more communications we will go from more digital instead of conventional electromechanical systems, etc. So, the smart grid infrastructure is very complicated. So, this is a picture of the current situation of the tra traditional smart, tra the traditional grid. So, for instance, you may found that uh, from the higher level in the transmission side to the low voltage down in the picture. So, you can see in the different um, in the different squares colors, you can find if they are in green, it means that it is very easy to operate and easy to manage and it is very monitored. However, as we go down, we see that it is very poor uh, operation and it is very low degree of monitoring. So that's very important because at the end, all these new uh, distributed energy resources will be connected in the low voltage or in the medium voltage. So if these voltage levels are currently very poorly uh, monitored and, and the operation is very difficult and is not very flexible, you have to send some guys over there to operate the network itself. So there is a lot to do in order to up update and upgrade this, this system. Okay, so what do we need to change? Okay, the problem is that we have very old assets more than 25 years old, both in the United States and Europe. So we also have very old ways of planning and operating the system. So the idea is like if we go to a smart grid, it's like changing our old fashioned Mini Cooper into a brand new Mini from uh, this year. Okay, so remember, we're talking about the same assets, but we are going to improve the operation and the maintenance of this equipment. So, a smart grid infrastructure requires new thinking, requires new technologies, for instance, communication infrastructure, requires new components, such as the virtual power plant, the microgrid, the market aggregator, etc. We need new agents to participate into this system. We have the consumers, which are very important drivers. We have the new distributed energy resources. And what is more important, we have the regulators because most of the, the, the agents participating here, for instance, all those related with the, the, with the network, these are regulated entities. So regulators must be capable to define the rules adequate to go for, for this smart grid in order to promote this smart grid within this regulated entity. Okay, so why are smart grids needed? So let's raise the second poll and it asks which of the following distributed energy resources demands the deployment of a smart grid for its integration into the distribution system. So I am asking which of these technologies are able to participate here? So let me write the second poll. So you can find distributed energy uh, resources such as distributed generation, is this generation solar, photovoltaics, uh, wind generation, microwave, etc., which are connected into the into the distribution level. We also have electric vehicles. We also have demand side management, which is important. And finally, we have all those renewables that are not directly connected to the distribution side, but goes up to the transmission level. For instance, wind generation, or can be offshore, onshore, etc. Okay. So. Okay, so we are nearly done. One couple of seconds. Okay, so let me close the poll and share with you the results. 
Okay, as I expected, distributed generation and demand side management are the winners, of course. Distributed generation is key, has been the first uh, energy distributed resource that raised up the problems of uh, needed active networks. And on the other hand, demand side management are also key because these are the efficiency that we are looking for into the system. So let's go now in order to identify within these four distributed energy resources how these impact into the into the current operation. Okay, so the first idea that I want to raise is that distributed generation and renewables has been increasing in the last in the last decade and but this what what is more important is not only these renewables has been integrated into the transmission level. As you can find here this is the transmission level and these are subtransmission and distribution level. So, so this is the Spanish case in order to make an example. So what is important is that these no new renewals not only are connected in the test transmission side but also are distributed along the medium and low voltage. So this is very important because this poses a real challenge for the operation of distribution systems, which nowadays wasn't very, very, very in that way. So let me raise an example of which is the impact of distributed generation in the investments. So these are the investments on the operational cost for a certain distribution network this is in Netherlands. We have another example in Germany and final one in Spain. So if you see here, if we increase the integration of distributed generation, the cost will increase. But, but let me check that this cost will increase up to 120%. So this is huge because if we do nothing, this is what we expect. So we expect that the flows will change the direction and then we will need some additional efforts in order to invest in the new network. So if we go to a smart grid, it means that if we are able to manage these loads, if we are able to curtail these loads, if we integrate new operational tools to the PSO, here you can see these are the savings that we get if we apply a smart grid. So the savings increase if the integration of renewables increase. Of course, if we have more renewables, then we will be able to manage more adequately the system. So these benefits can increase up to 35%. So this is an example of how can smart grids contribute to reduce the overcost for the integration of, in this case, this distributed generation into the system. But how can we regulate the distributed generation. Of course, we have to be intelligent and we have to give smart regulation to the DSO. For instance, we can create some kind of signal in, in, a, in, in, a, specific, in a specific revenue scheme mechanisms. Here you can see if we apply to the previous situation where we have more and more integration of renewables here, more and more integration of renewables here. So if we do nothing, Okay, so the DSO will have to invest more. However, if we these two values are zero, which is the current situation in most countries, okay, so the DSO will feel that there is a loss of incomes due to the excess of integration generation because nowadays most distributed uh, the distribution companies are remunerated according to the increase of the load, not to the increase of distributed generation. So if we apply into this revenue scheme a certain values to the lambdas, then we will be able to avoid this negative effect into the system. So we will send these blue bars, and these blue bars means if we identify adequate values for this. So we can improve regulation. We can make the regulation smart in order to be able to integrate these devices. So, and what is more important, we also have to send signals to the distributed generation. For instance, using the time of use tariffs or location tariffs in order to place this regulation, this uh, generation where they improve the system instead of provoking uh, problems to the system. So now let's move to these renewables which are connected into the transmission side. So integration of renewables, we, as 
you may know from all of our webinars, uh, poses new challenges for the operation of the power system. You can see here two situations. In the first one, there was a loss of 700 megawatts, a sudden loss due, due to a failure in a, in, a, in, a, in a nearby cable. And we have another situation is this second one, when if there is an excess of wind generation, sometimes we have to make some kind of curtailment in order to guarantee the correct operation of the system. So what can the smarter networks do? Okay, so first of all, there is a need to control both the wind and solar production. And how can we do it? Okay, so we can improve prediction, we can create new control centers, etc. And on the other hand, we also can have some install new advanced technologies in the power system. For instance, using fax devices in order to change the, the, the flows, the way flows are moving through the networks. We can use dynamic line rating, we can use high voltage DC line, etc. So let's go to the second part, the third part, which is the impact of electric vehicles. Okay, so as you may know, electric vehicles is also one promising load for, for, for the next 10, 20 years. So the, in the future, we expect like 50% of, the, of these electric vehicles being in the 2030, in the most optimistic X scenario. But what, what can a smart grid do to easy this connection? So you can see here the comparison between the cost, the reinforcement cost, if we connect these electric vehicles in the distribution side, if we connect and we charge the electric vehicles in the first case, here you can see this is the peak charging. Okay, we charge all the electric vehicles here. There is a second option, which is the valley charging. Okay, we connect all the vehicles during the valley hours. And in the third case, we connect these electric vehicles uh, in trying to fill these valley hours. So this is the smartest way, this is the dumb way, and this is a smarty way. Okay, so here you can see the effect both in the uh, investments in the low voltage, in the transformer, and in the medium voltage. So if we do nothing, we will have a very incremental cost in this old, on these three networks. However, if we work on a smarter applications, for instance, being very smart or being just uh, being shifting the demand into, this, in, into the valley hours, we are able to cut very much this over cost. So, if we have an electric vehicle, we still need many questions to be answered. For instance, uh, both in the regulatory and the technical point of view. For instance, which is going to be the ownership of the different charging infrastructures? Which are the new agents that can participate into, into selling and buying the energy? The definition of tariffs in order for, for, for me, for making the charging smart, etc. Okay, so last. Last but not least, we will go to the demand side management that, I mean, I saw that was one of, of the key drivers for the deployment of the smart grid. So as you may know, we have different measures for demand side management, the feedback of consumers, transactions, different pricing, different pricing schemes. Demand side management is based on, on smart meters, on new technologies like the energy box, smart license, etc. And of course, new agents will appear, such as the suppliers, the aggregators, the energy services company, etc. So, in order to avoid uh, this, um, this happen, what is this couple is talking in this cartoon, in order to avoid this increase of the cost by, you know, the definition of the smart grid, some regulation is still needed. So we need to go for uh, adequate tariff designs, we still need some encouraging actions for the consumers to participate into the demand side management. We also, from the regulatory point of view, must be able to prevent that the consumer is bearing the technology, the technology development risk. So it means that there are still many things that should be uh, defined. Okay, so. The next question is, how much do a smart grids cost? So, 
the one important thing in order to, to understand the pricing of the smart grids is to get the full picture of the cost for the energy system. So this is the cost for, in this case, this is the Spanish system. So you can see that half of the cost goes to the energy, market price plus, plus capacity payment, and the other half goes to other regulatory regulated activities. Within the regulated activities, one third, which is the green pies, so this green slide is associated to network. So this is very important because if we are able to save some money from the incremental cost for integrating energy into the system, we are able to save some money through a smart grid deployment, we are going to earn a huge amount of money. And secondly, we have some kind of barrier or drawback, is that currently in most countries the price of electricity is very cheap, so we pay usually like 1.5 euro per day. So that's very, that's very low because it is very difficult. For instance, if we go to convince people to go from demand side management, this is going to be a main barrier because they will not care about this few amount of money. So, following the every uh, report on cost analysis for smart grids. Here I have the, uh, the cost for the different options for smart grid into the transmission side. So you can see the different options here. You can, we, we can include some kind of protection equipment in order to avoid these kind of terrorism activities. We include some insulator, um, advanced insulation, etc. So here you can enumerate the different options and the respective cost of, of each of them. So, it is very important that one of the, let's say, more costly option but uh, key alternatives is the development of control centers for the manager, for the managing of renewables in the system. So here you find, this is the picture of uh, the control center for renewables in Spain, where you can find the different maps, different maps for wind generation production, solar thermal production, we also have solar photovoltaics production, and this is cogeneration production. So here you can find all different prediction and current situation. So these tools are very important for the transmission system operator to deal with the integration of, but in this case, renewables in the transmission side. On the second hand, we have the investments in the distribution side. Okay, so in the distribution, the first and the key issue is the smart meters. You can see in the picture above. The second point, which is even more costly because the smart meters has an, an, a mandatory rollout in most, for instance, most European countries and in the, in the states, some, some states has been also going through the rollout of smart meters. So the second option and second step is the deployment of a more automated distribution network. Here found, you can find, this is the switches which are automated and, and here you can find some should be stationed from medium voltage to low voltage, which is automized. And third, what is about the consumer? Okay, so the consumer also needs some investments in order to go to for, for being smart. So the first thing is the smart meter, we see in the previous slide. So the second thing is that we need some kind of communication. In this case, I, I bring here some example of uh, this is a screenshot of um, um, a company, a retailer company from the United States. But we also need, if we want to go further in order to make more controllable loads, we can go to this kind of automatic control of the, the, of the, uh, of the cooling and heating system or to automated white goods. Okay, so the cost here will be built mainly in the automation of the different, uh, different devices. So if we sum up all the different costs, the aggregated value for the April report indicates that the cost for the distribution network is the highest, as you can see. So this is consistent to our first approach. We were talking about that all these distribution, um, distributed energy resources will be located in low voltage and medium voltage. And this area has poor control, has poor operation, poor monitoring, okay? So in this case, it is expected that the full smart grid deployment in the, in the European Union 
will be about 115,000 million euros until 2030, and it is nearly four times in the United States, as seen in the in the April report. So, on the other hand, the expected benefits can be classified in many topics, as you can see here. For instance, if we go to smart grid, we will really easy the integration of renewables, both in the transmission and distribution networks. So this will reduce the need of conventional fuel-based power plants. So this will improve the environmental, and this will reduce the need of additional capacity. And of course, the cost of energy will be reduced because we don't need to burn fuel. We will use wind and solar generation instead. Okay, so some practical examples to evaluate the benefits is this, I take this from, from Italy, where as you may know, there is a really complete rollout of smart meters across the country in nearly a decade, 10 years. So it is important uh, to notice that uh, the operational cost seen by the consumer, by the final consumer in these 10 years has been reduced by half. And moreover, the quality of service has been improved by three times. So this is just a very important example of how can smart meters provide some benefits to the final consumer, and the final consumer can really see which is the impact in their field. There is another example that presents, for instance, this is the reduction of the average interruption time. If we increase this is the interruption time, and if we increase the automation degree, these are for different type of networks, real networks. So we can see here that the, it is not needed really a full deployment of a smart grid in order to, to, to get all the benefits. If we get around here, that around 20, 30 percent of the automation in a distribution network, we are getting really full deployment of the benefits that we can get from, uh, in this case, the, rel the improved reliability of the system. So let me bring the, four, the third and final poll and try to address which, is the, which of the following is the key barrier for the deployment of a smart grid. Do you feel this is going to be the technology risk because of the obsolescence of the different devices? Do you think it's going to be the standardization that we need in order to provide cheap devices instead of if there's no standardization, will each of the different manufacturers will build on their own and the, and, and the cost will increase? And it, if it has to do with the co cost recovery of the investors, both these manufacturers and also the distribution system operators, if they feel that they are going to invest in something that they will not be able to recover the benefits through okay through the tariffs or through a regulated revenue or through any other remuneration option. Okay, so okay, so I see that most of you are economic guys. So okay, let's now close the poll and okay, so you can see the cost recovery to investors is a uh, main risk. Okay, it is completely true. Indeed, the different costs that we, and different barriers that we face, the first one is of course obsolescent because, I mean, you can see, for instance, in the rollout of the smart meters that in five years, we already reached the obsolescence of some softwares that were used. So that's very important because if, if you have no, enough time to recover the investment, and if you fall into the obsolescence of the devices, not only the smart meters, but other equipment which are more related with uh, digital equipment, it is really very risky. On the second hand, we have a high cost for the, tele for the communication standards and, and the metering, and nowadays we are facing a current economic crisis scenario, so it's very difficult to justify new investments if you are not able to recover this money in, uh, in not much time. Okay, so it is also very important that uh, the needs that we have to go through in order to avoid these barriers, of course, the main driver is, uh, is to be able to incentivize 
the distribution system operator because at the end this uh, agent will be responsible for the deployment of the smart grids in the medium and low voltage side but of course before going to the to this innovation uh, incentives we have to take care of the manufacturers in order to to facilitate their way to the uh, deployment of new equipment etc so in order to try to solve these barriers we will now show some kind of uh, bridges that we can decide we can design in order to go to the to the smart grid so the first uh, roadmap that I can bring to you is this roadmap from Euroelectric it's called 10 steps to a smart grid it proposes like this uh, three stages to get in one decade to the complete deployment of the smart grids in, in, in Europe. So the first stage is about the standardization at a European and national level of the different uh, technologies used for the smart grids. There is a second stage that has to do with the rollout of both the smart meters on the one hand and on the other hand the facilitation of the integration of distributed generated resources, mainly the participation of uh, distributed generation. Okay, and a third step and a final step is the idea is to add the final consumer as part of the operation of the system and also to integrate in a larger scale these new renewables, these distributed energy storage, including the, the e-mobility, the electric vehicles, etc. So, in this sense, uh, the European Union has been very active since 2009 with different directives trying to push the, the different countries for, for implementing smart grid actions. This has been, um, has not been only a way, but, but has been together with the European Technology Platform for the Smart Grid and the ZEP plan. They have been financing different projects in order to make some kind of piloting of, of this smart grid. Also, the European Standards Association are working in order to be able to create the standards before with the help of the manufacturers. So here I bring some, some example of the implementation through different research and pilot projects in Europe. You can see in, the, in this map the, the cost and the investments on the different projects and here you can see the description of the different projects which are located in, in, in the countries. So I bring you here, you can check here this, um, this web page, this link, in order that if you want to go into more detail in the different, in the different projects. Some key examples of uh, European projects are the grid for you project, the address, uh, the grid for you deals with the implementation of six the most big, size, big scale demonstrations across Europe of the smart grids, the address product and advanced deals with the demand side management and you have other options, other projects. So if we go to the States, the States has also been very active since 2001 on efficiency programs and active networks. And you can see here in the map the smart grid projects across the United States with uh, the different topics in colors. For instance, the green is for the transmission system the blue is, is for smart metering, um, the red one is for electric system in the distribution side. Okay, so it is also very important to see that the, um, that the states is also working on this. So why? It's because they feel that this is really opportunity, both from the, from the cost system, let's say from the operational cost system, but also from the manufacturer point of view. So, my concluding remarks is, first, smart grids are a challenge in technology, economics, and regulation. Of course it is. And it's more important, this is the key enabling factor to achieve the objectives of the European Commission, the 2020-20 objectives for 2020. It is also very important that the cost-benefit analysis needs to be assessed under different scenarios and boundary conditions. This is very critical because if not, maybe we are not able to recover the money through the benefits that we are getting through the deployment of the smart grid. 
pilot projects are the are the current state of the art. So now we have to work in different pilot projects in order to demonstrate that and to evaluate that the different smart grid options work correctly. And what is more important, can be scalable to a higher level and also replicable to other third countries. The smart grid is clearly an opportunity for new businesses and technology deployment. So that's why both the United States and the European Union are pushing very hard in order to deploy this kind of smart grid because they feel that this is going to be a new revolution in the operation of the power system. This power system has been operated from 100 years in just a similar way. So this is really like a breakthrough. We need to go for this opportunity. We need to create more business, business around it. And finally, we talk about the regulation. So the regulator will be very busy these new years because he must be able to promote efficiency in the operation of the power system, as he's been doing for a very long time. He must be able to balance the incentives to the regulated businesses because, as you remember, all these smart grids have to do with the networks, mainly the distribution networks and part of the transmission networks. So both transmission and distribution are regulated entities. So the regulator must be very careful in order to design adequate signals to the different uh, regulated entities to be efficient and to go to the smart grid. And finally, and more important, we need to be able to share the benefits among all system users. For instance, in the case of Italy, where we get a reduction of the uh, operational cost of the system and an improvement of the quality, of course, the improvement of the quality is directly, um, it directly applies to the, to the final consumer. However, the reduction of cost sometimes are not seen by the but, but, but the final consumer. So we must be able to design this kind of, of, of regulation to be inadequate in that way. So that's it. I get here some relevant references. In order, so if you want to go into more in-depth analysis of the different uh, topics, you can check here. And uh, this is also one recommended book. The pity is that it is just in Spanish, so you, here you can uh, download it from the web, covering many topics on smart grids. So uh, this is it. So thanks very much for your attention, and I really hope that this um, webinar uh, raised you some questions and you know and make you feel more uh, interesting and and get the importance of the smart grid deployment in the next year. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo, for your excellent presentation. Let me just say that there were many questions submitted today by our audience, so thank you very much for that. Uh, however, unfortunately, we won't have enough time to answer for all of these questions. So let me just point out that right now on your computer screen, you can see the email of Pablo. Therefore, uh, I would like to say that you can always contact Pablo and ask him some additional questions. I hope that, Pablo, you won't mind to answer for some of the questions from our public also after the webinar. Okay, so right now let's just briefly, quickly proceed to the Q&A and the first question from the public will be, is there any cost-benefit analysis for the implementation of smart grids in Europe? Okay, good question. I mean, so the answer is, uh, is very tricky because uh, it depends on who you ask, you will get a different answer. So if you ask, for instance, the manufacturer, they will tell you that, of course, the benefits are going to be, you know, very huge. So, so it's good for the business in order to build more assets and more devices. If you ask the distributor, maybe he will act, answer you that, of course. I mean, if this will be really interesting for for the business, they would have done it for for some years ago. So, as far as I know, uh, although there are some, you know, very good analysis on. For instance, the, the implementation of the smart meters, how they have improved the, the final user cost, etc. Regarding the smart grids, the problem that we face is that we can more or less measure the benefits, but these benefits are nowadays working. We are working now in piloting projects. 
but the cost of the different devices are still not available because the manufacturers don't really want to, to see their cost. First, they want to see which are the benefits. Now, we have to go to the regulator, and the regulator must, must set which are the revenue drivers in order to make this cost and benefit analysis balance in order to, to share these this, uh, benefits to, to all the agents. So the end, I mean, at the end, we until now don't have a cost-benefit analysis, a serious one. So nowadays we are just piloting. So I think that in the next years we will get some kind of interesting result. So that's it. Okay, thank you. So the next question will be, why is the gas grid excluded from the smart grid argument? Sorry, will you repeat? Uh, why is the gas grid excluded from the smart grid Paradigm, and I have to say that there were many questions regarding that. Whether it's yeah, why I mean, is gas excluded? Yeah, I mean, initially it is excluded in the way that a smart grid uh, born uh, during the analysis of the integration of, of these kind of renewables, of renewables both in the transmission level and in the distribution level. So the first problem that the transmission and distribution system operators were the integration of these devices. Of course. In the medium term, what we are facing and in other countries are facing is not only the effect of gas, but also the effect of heat. So in some countries, when we talk about smart grid, we talk about the integration of both heat, electricity, and gas. Okay? So, but initially, as the way that we can approach both gas sector, both uh, electricity sector in the low voltage side are quite different because they use different infrastructure. Until now, these are the couple. So let's say that now the smart grid only deal with with uh, electricity. Of course, we can say that we can be smart if we talk about gas. But uh, the options that nowadays we have to be smart with gas are very low and are more or less decoupled from 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 that system, let's say. Okay, so uh, the next question will be very connected to what you just said now, and do you think that the situation will change? Do you think that the gas will be somehow uh, included in the smart grids in the future? Uh, yes, I mean, it really depends on the country and, and on the country needs. So, for instance, I can say that in the case of Spain, where, I mean, on the countries that are, you know, in the south of uh, in just close to the Mediterranean countries, the, the use of gas is, uh, is every year going down. So let's say that uh, in future, let's say in 20, 50 years, it is expected that we will change uh, the heat option using gas to the use of uh, electric heating. Okay? So this is this may occur in the in those countries where you know in the close to the Mediterranean Sea, but in other countries, you know, in the mid in the Middle Europe or or up in the in, in the North Europe, things are completely different because you need not I mean the need of heat and are very are more intensive. So sometimes you we talk about the use of cogeneration of domestic cogeneration in order to use gas not only to provide electricity, but also to provide heat. But this is also, uh, you know, a uh, very trending topic because one of the options for the, for the sustainability of, of, the, of the European Union is to try to avoid the dependency of gas fuel from other third countries. So that's why, I mean, we always try to focus on more integration of renewables and in order to reduce this dependence. So in future, I see that, of course, gas in some countries may will be an option, but in other countries will maybe not disappear, but will be really negligible in the domestic, okay. from the domestic point of view. Okay, thank you. The next question will be, how can regulators ensure that smart grid investments are carried out by grid operators in combination with incentive regulation? Poof. <laughs> So that's a question for the regulator, not for me. <laughs> not for me. Okay. So I just can see that you can check an example. There is a 
for instance, in the UK, which the I mean the regulator is very active. Again, they have created as as we saw in the presentation this low carbon fund, where they give money not only to the different projects that has some kind of piloting of this, for instance, smart meters or energy efficiency or certain certain other points, but they also have some kind of tax reduction for these uh, distribution companies. So, I mean, I don't want to get into much detail because that's not really my expertise, but, but the thing is that there are some, um, some already settled approaches. They are working very well. And for instance, this from the incentive uh, from the low carbon incentive regulation, that's a very nice example of how to do things work correctly. Okay, and I have to say that we are running out of time. We'll see, maybe we'll still have time for two questions. Let's just ask this one and then we'll see how much time we have left. Uh, so this question will be, how much do you think the advent of smart grid changed the current electricity markets in Europe? Okay, so of course, I mean, they will change very much. On the one hand, we have the one of the things that the current market does not have is that we don't have electricity elasticity in the in the demand side. We have, of course, elasticity in the the procurement side because I mean the different generations have different costs. But the demand side will really change the future of understanding the the market. So the markets will be more flexible. So as the participation of the aggregators, like representative for, for the for the final consumers, will be more and more important. They will be able to manage the loads very much. So they, are, they will provide more flexibility to the system to operate. They will provide, you know, additional support to to, to the different schemes of, of 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 procurement, the different ancillary services. So I think the market will change very much because the demand side management will be now active instead of being passive for a very long time. Okay, so I have to say, we have still time for the last question, but this will be really the last. Uh, so the last question is, don't we need a heavier distribution grid in order to react fully on wind and solar generation? Uh, I should say that uh, not really, because the, I mean, if we clearly see if, I mean, nowadays the power flows goes from, from the substation connected to the transmission side down to the distribution level. Okay, so if we integrate more and more distributed resources in the, in the low voltage, let's say, or in the medium voltage, then there will be a time where the, you know, with the flux, with the power flows going from up to down will be reduced then will be, let's say, zero, and they will go up. So the amount of renewables that we need to, you know, to double the installed capacity is very much. Okay, so initially, I think we have a lot of room nowadays in the distribution side in order to integrate more and more uh, renewables. Of course, if we have, as, as you, as we have uh, already seen in some slides, we have to be very careful because if we don't apply any active approach to the uh, to the operation of these new systems, of course the cost will increase very much. But the point is that we can be able to manage the high integration of renewables in the system if we are smart enough, and we don't need many additional investments in the system. Just being a bit smart. Of course, this being smart requires investments, but not investments in copper and iron. It requires investment in providing more intelligence to the to the operation of the network. Thank you very much, Pablo, for answering for all these questions and obviously for your presentation. It was a pleasure to host you in the FSR webinars. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Pablo, I have to say goodbye to you right now, and I will switch back to my presentation to my computer screen. Therefore, thank you, Pablo. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye. And now I'm coming back to my computer screen. I am doing this right now. I think that you will be able to, to see it now. I check it and it's everything is fine. Okay, so therefore let's proceed and let's just make some final announcements for today's webinar. So just to conclude, let me say that right after I will 
close to this webinar automatically on your computer screen will appear a survey. This survey is consisted of eight questions and I strongly encourage you to fill out this questionnaire because this will help us to evaluate today's session and also make some improvements in our future webinars. Okay, and on Friday you will all receive a follow-up email. In this email I will thank you for participating in today's webinar and also you will receive a link in that email where uh, you will be able to find a PDF from today's presentation and the recording of today's webinar. The recording will be also available at the FSR YouTube channel. Many of you have asked me about the PDF, so as you can see, it will be available on our website. And also in that email, you will see that uh, there is an announcement regarding the next webinar, and there will be also a link that where you will be able to register for the next webinar. And the next webinar will take place on the 11th of December, as always at 11 a.m. And this time we will tackle an issue of gas security of supply, and the presenter of that webinar will be Jacques de Jong. Uh, a senior fellow at uh, Klingendal International Energy Program. Uh, therefore, if you would like to register for this event, you can uh, wait until Friday and when you will receive the follow-up email, or you can go right now to our website, and this is the view of the website from yesterday. Uh, right now, this part here is updated, so if you go to the main website and click here, you can register for the next webinar. However, if you would like to uh, get some further information regarding other trainings organized by Florence Square Regulation, just please go here and you'll find all information uh, under this link. Okay, or you can always contact me if you have any questions regarding the webinars or any other events organizing here, here at Florence Square Regulation. And once again, if you have any questions regarding the content of today's webinar, please contact Pablo by using the email that you can see right now on your computer screen. Okay, so right now it's time to say goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us today and I hope that you will join us once again. Uh, the next webinar will be the last one in 2012, but don't worry, we will be back in 2013. Uh, so thank you very much once again. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.